All right, great. So again, we're talking about the waste streams uh, in the ocean. We uh, started with you guys doing a little bit of uh, brainstorming as to why these various factors might be a threat. Um, then this was your exercise you guys just did in terms of things you would specifically measure here in Ventura County. So that's cool. And then we mentioned again that pollution is obviously this hugely uh, uh, widely held greatest threat to our environment um, across countries, across time, etc. And so a lot of our fellow citizens think that pollution is bad. So, so let's, and, and really bad enough that we need to make it a priority. So let's look at a couple different things here. I have a couple videos to show you guys, a couple things to run through. So the first, this is this, uh, here's a cartoon talking about our plastic age. And, um, and so this guy says, I have a plastic car, disposable plastic products, blah, 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 blah. This is great. So put it in plastic bags. And then this guy says, you can save a lot of steps and just throw it all right in the ocean uh, right now. Here is, this is this is a little bit long, it's like 13 minutes or so, so maybe we'll skip around a little bit and you guys can watch this when you're done. But this is a, a cartoon from 1956. So this is a cartoon from 1956. I took off. I took careful bearings and set out for my goal. Landed close to what seemed to be an endless procession of state limousines. They moved quickly and yet with fantastic smoothness. I just had to get a closer look at one of those Earth mobiles. It seems that almost everybody in this country has one of those, uh, uh, they call them automobiles. They use them for transportation, for business, for pleasure. They use them for all sorts of things. I found that these vehicles gather at places called service stations, where they are fed, uh, lubricated, uh, that's how they beat friction and given the finest care. The source of their nourishment was something called petroleum. A power source like that must be a highly prized state secret. I had to find out about it. Hmm. Perhaps the secret lay within this government archives building. It was heavily guarded, but casting discretion to the winds, I walked boldly inside. Their code was remarkably easy to break. They merely substituted the word oil for petroleum. 
and I soon got hold of a veritable mine of classified information. I began to assimilate the material. I soon found out that though petroleum products are easily found anywhere, petroleum itself is a very elusive substance. Experts have to search for it constantly in all the most likely and unlikely places with all kinds of scientific devices. When they figure they found a good spot, they drill a hole in the ground called an oil well, for almost all oil lies far beneath the surface of the earth. These wells go down thousands of feet and cost a lot of money to drill, but that's no guarantee that they're going to find oil. Matter of fact, in exploratory drilling, only one well in nine finds any oil at all. Only one in 44 recovers enough oil to pay for itself. And only one in almost a thousand makes a major discovery. Pretty big odds. Yet America's proved reserves, the oil supplies still underground, have kept increasing steadily. I couldn't imagine how this ever-increasing supply of oil was achieved until I found out that there's not just one, but thousands of oil companies all competing with each other to discover and develop new sources of oil. For believe it or not, in the USA, anyone who is willing to risk it can drill for oil. But oil discovery right, there we go. is Good only times. part so you of the story. You can watch the rest of that if you want. But, um, uh, so that's, that's sort of the uh, early, sort of, sort of the getting our legs under us in, the, in what we might call the plastic age now. Um, this is from about uh, a decade before that little cartoon was made. This is from a, a book called uh, Appropriately Plastics. Um, and so this, you know, th this really spoke to, um, we, th we saw these substances as really heralding this new age, right? So this quote, I'll read it. Um, it is a free world. Is, uh, they're talking about the, the world they're trying to create with all these new uh, petroleum products. It is a world free from moth and rust and full of color, a world largely built of synthetic materials made from the most universally distributed substances, a world in which nations are more and more independent of localized natural resources, a world in which man, by the way, just man, uh, like a magician, makes what he wants for almost every need out of what is beneath and around him. And then uh, later on, uh, in that same book quoted in this, this paper a few years ago, um, is basically um, this notion that uh, we really saw saw plastics and our oil production as the just like we were talking about before the net benefits right the positive side of stuff and from that same um, that same book these guys talk about how much brighter and cleaner the world would be if we had everybody used more plastics and everybody used more petroleum products right so again uh, this was thought of as a good thing. What we know now is that uh, while clearly there, there are tremendous benefits from having all these, these products, uh, amazing products we can create from, say, petroleum, there's also downsides. And here's but a couple of them. So this image is, this, this rainbow runner is an image of mine from the late 1980s, I think, maybe early 1990s. So this is um, a, a, a pelagic fish, a rainbow runner that uh, just caught in the middle of the South Pacific and, you, and just pulled up on the deck of this boat and gutted with a fish knife, and then its gut was full of all these chunks of plastic, right? This picture on the right is from a recent paper where these guys did some, uh, a, some net, a net tow and then pulled the net tow in, and so we have uh, you know, some plankton in here and this and that, and then we have like large chunks of plastic, little chunks of plastic, plastic beads, fibers, all kinds of stuff. So this is part of our heritage also of going down this road of creating lots of um, uh, plastics. We also have things like this. So, mic so, so the, the uh, marketing term is microbeads because those sound, those sound maybe less, less uh, or more inviting than um, nasty plastic that you rub on your face and ingest and stuff like that. So this is from cosmetics. And so what you can see here is, in this case, these are very uniform. These guys have been broken open, but these are, uh, generally speaking, very uniformly shaped things. And so there's, you know, potentially great value if you want to put on, let's say, makeup to be really smooth. You know, a very even coat, a very even 
uh, cover, or if you want to, to abrade something with a particular uh, degree of coarseness and stuff like that. The problem is, or one of the problems is, um, that this stuff, uh, so one of the reasons we, we, we make these, you know, stuff out of, of uh, cups out of plastic, et cetera, is because the cups are, the cups are cups, right? The cups, we can use them as cups and they're great, they're cheap, but also they, they um, are, they'll stand up, right? They're not like out of paper, they won't fall down in a minute, they'll, they'll stick up to putting water in today, pour it out, putting water in tomorrow. And so that ability of these compounds to persist means that they can get translocated. And so, for example, this is from a recent paper from uh, uh, about a year ago. Um, yeah, about a year ago, uh, a little bit less than a year ago. And these guys essentially just did uh, drove ships around the ocean and did some tows. And so the areas where the color is hot is the greatest concentration of plastics. And this is in surface water now, so we're talking about the top of the ocean. And obviously the areas uh, where we tend to see them are these gyre formations and these areas that, that tend to concentrate uh, other materials in the surface, not just plastic, but wood and, and algal propagules and things like that. Um, we see that there's obvious, so th this is the range of stuff by region, North Pacific, North Atlantic, South Pacific, South Atlantic, and then the Indian Ocean, right? So one, two, three, four, and then five, uh, these areas we're just showing. And uh, uh, essentially what we're looking at is we're looking at uh, uh, different ranges and sizes of these guys. We also find that if we go out and we say, oh, there's a bunch of plastic in the water. And, and so the, um, the sizes here are, this is, um, what we measured in the field, the blue bars, um, at least we're talking about things like surface waters. So, so um, blue is what we actually measured. Red is what we would predict from the physics of breaking down. So if we had a, a, a styrofoam cup and then we put it in the water and the water tumbled it around and broke into two pieces of styrofoam cups and then the tide washed over it again and broke into four pieces, etc. right? Just so the basic is starting with X amount of uh, an X size Thing, it's going to be broken down more and more and more. What we see is, is we predict a more even distribution of these things or a more um, uh, uh, lots of little things and we don't necessarily see that. We, we see this peak that's around uh, uh, one to two millimeters, one, two to five millimeters, kind of that, that area is where we see a lot of these guys and we don't see as many of of the super, super small things as we might otherwise predict. This, I'm not saying these things don't exist. They absolutely do. We're measuring them, but not as many as we would, would uh, predict from first principles. Uh, guesses as to why that might be? What, what, why, why is our modeled uh, prediction of the size of plastic pollution different from what we're actually seeing? It's get, oh yeah, so it's getting broken apart. So the broken apart is going to tend to sh t take a piece that starts on this. I should have started, sorry, I should have oriented you guys. So this is uh, uh, the scale. Or sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so this, this is small, this is big. The modeled and measured does a pretty good job when we're talking about relatively large pieces. But when we start to get smaller and smaller, it starts to diverge. And then when we get really small, it really diverges. So why is that? Yes. Because these things are not, so, so at this stage, they're kind of behaving, well, we don't know, but this is the current, this, this is what we, initial evidence suggests this, and this seems to probably be what's going on. Uh, here, what's going on is physics. The wind, the waves, the, the crashing against the rock, that kind of stuff. And so, okay, that's cool, and that's cool, and that's cool. By the time we get here, we're starting to see pieces that are biologically relevant. So things that uh, 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 organisms could ingest, things that organisms could try to eat, things that could get stuck in um, mucus webs and, and various things like that. So, so the probable explanation for why the measure differs from the modeled is this is not Mars. There's life interacting with these pieces of pollution and changing their relative abundance 
in again, and this is this is this is the floating stuff on the surface of the ocean. So influencing the sort of freely distributed stuff and presumably concentrating those pieces in other locations or transforming them further. That makes sense? Okay. Um, this is a paper, this is a figure from a, a pretty famous paper from 2004 that first really drew a lot of attention to this, or one of the first papers that drew attention to this. And so here, let's, let's look down here. Here's fibers per 50 mils of sediment. So um, Vanessa's working on this for a capstone. And uh, so Vanessa can tell us about this. But basically, we, we take a scoop of stuff. In this case, sediment. We take a scoop of sediment. Shake it up. Maybe put some stuff like salt or whatever in it to make, make stuff more easily floatable. And you float it up and you suck it up and you count the stuff. Is that, is that a technical description of what you're doing? No, okay. Scientifically accurate. scientifically accurate. Great. And so uh, the first thing I'll point out here is here we have sandy beaches. Uh, coastal estuaries, so coastal wetlands, and then uh, and, and so this sorry, so this would be this would be sandy intertidal, this would be uh, wetland intertidal, mud flatty kind of thing, and this is subtidal areas uh, near shore, and what we see is uh, we have stuff first. The first thing to notice we have stuff everywhere. Everywhere we look, we find this stuff, which is worrying because these products did not exist 100 years ago. Or, or just, yeah, basically it didn't really exist 100 years ago. So um, everywhere we look is the first conclusion we tend to see these things. Secondly, they're not evenly distributed throughout the environment. Uh, we saw that first, so that first here, right? And that there's some, some areas of, and we're talking about this, the skin of the ocean, there's some areas where there's more plastics than others. This is our first indication. If we look at the, the bottom of the ocean, if we look at the benthos, we see that there are some differences here. Some areas have more plastics than others. And then perhaps one of the most, one of the, uh, most concerning aspects of this, they were able to go through, and in this case, they, um, I think what they did here, I'm trying to remember, I think what they did here is they went back and they looked at, so these guys are doing these transects, these fisheries transects. Um, and this is, so these initially were, these were not designed to look at plastics or pollution. This was designed to look at fishery stuff. So fishery stuff, we look at fish, we look at larvae, we take net toes and stuff like that. So, so as, a, as an ancillary part of our taking the net toes, we grab things sometimes other than the, than the little larvae. We grab some other stuff. So you can go back and you can look at these things. You can either look at the larvae or look at the fish and cut up these preserved fish. Because a plastic, piece of plastic isn't going to degrade, right? Maybe the bacterium that we had in that jar maybe 60 years ago is going to maybe have died. <laughs> but that chunk of plastic that's whatever, one millimeter by two millimeters, that's going to be the same, right? So we could potentially go back. And they did that. So they went back to these, these historic surveys uh, in the 60s, in the 70s. And then uh, I think they did some of these in the 80s, and this was mostly in the 90s. And what we see is there's this overall increase in so okay so so here's the dates the ba the gray is the amount of fibers in seawater so this is not a piece of something this is a little mini string of plastic and so the fibers are growing dramatically after the 1970s and then this is this is uh and so th this is per this is per um this has been per decade, and this is just the overall pattern they see from year to year. So it's this, it's this pretty clear uh, trend that seems to be increasing over time. As we've started to look at this, we've actually started to notice that just like we can look at the diversity of a community, we can also look at the diversity of the uh, po uh, pol pollutants. And so in this case, these guys uh, mostly did sediments. Sediment, 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 sediment. So sediment cores down deep. And I'll, I'll show you the data in a second, but, but down deep. Um, a couple of these things, these uh, orange guys, were actually, they looked at coral. So if, if uh, deep sea corals had actually had pieces of plastic embedded in them. Um, but this data just, uh, so you can, you can find your favorite area if you're interested in the polar areas, you can look at one and two. If you're interested in the Mediterranean, you can look at you know, six through nine. Um, and what we see is in some areas, 
not only do we have the structure based on if it's a if it's a uh, uh, a fiber or a piece of plastic, we also have the types of plastics. So uh, black is acrylic. Um, gray is polyester. Most of the polyester is coming from clothes. Uh, we, we spin po we spin plastics into fibers and then we weave those into clothes that maybe some of you guys are wearing right now. And so we see some areas like let's say this number five right here is um, dominated by polyester. Other areas like number three out here off of Europe, uh, very proportionally speaking, very little um, uh, stuff is coming from polyester, etc. And this is this is what it, this is what that data looks like in a more quantitative area. So some of these guys are taking some of these these samples were taken almost you know three and a half kilometers down in the bottom of the ocean, and they're still finding something. The metric here is 15 fibers, 15 pieces of plastic per 50 mils of sediment that they. So 50 mils is like this, right? 50 mils is a little thimbleful kind of thing, right? We're not talking about. The, the volume of the classroom or something. We're talking about a little teeny aliquot of sediment is, is yielding a lot of stuff. And so we see is, ev first thing you know is, again, everywhere these guys looked, they found microplastics. Again, the deep ocean. Last time we talked about the deep ocean and there's this, there's, we have this notion of relatively low energy inputs, right? Relatively low biomass per unit area, unless we're talking about hydrothermal vents. So generally thought of as a, as a sort of a slower, you know, it's more like do ba dee da do ba dee da do ba dee da. Right? It's not, it's not the big New York happening city where there's dynamic things, right? It's a much more um, lower kinetic energy environment on a minute-to-minute on a -minute basis, right? But even with that, even with that, we're, we're, we've, we've somehow contaminated that part of our planet with all kinds of plastics. Uh, and then here's just some numbers. Uh, from some using some historic uh, data that people re reported. So, so uh, uh, lots of plastic around, lots of plastic. So uh, where is this plastic coming from? So what do you guys think the, the when we talk about plastic, tr plastic, plastic waste or plastic trash, where do you guys think that's coming from? Food storage containers, okay. So, so like this right here, this thing, okay. What else? Right, beverage bottle, like right here. These are all these are all plastic uh, uh, soda bottles and, and water bottles and stuff. Cool. Plastic bags. Okay. Say again. Everything in the grocery store. <laughs> plastic comes from everything in the grocery store. Okay, good. Okay, straws, industrial plastics, things like that. So okay, so uh, so maybe the packaging material that. So when we when we so we uh, have our new drying ovens here in the lab, right? They came in a big giant crate, big honking crate, because that's an incredibly expensive piece of equipment, and we don't want it to we don't want it to get damaged, right? So we surround we we cushion it with stuff, and in 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 addition to just the wood cushioning the the rigid outer crate, it had all this this plastic foam and plastic uh, 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 you know bumpers and things like that inside of it, so that kind of jazz, absolutely. Um, another concerning thing is, so one, this plastic is now appearing to be ubiquitous in surface waters, very common down deep. We've seen that the um, uh, relative abundance of these things is a little bit different. It seemed to imply there's biological activity. Here's, here's a great example showing that there is actual biological activity. So in this case, these are some mussels from Australia. Or, or sorry, we're imaging a mussel from Australia. And uh, what we've seen is this is, this is in the, the bloodstream of this mussel. So this, this, this plastic has left the, the digestive tract, left the mouth parts, right? And, it's, and they're broken up into smaller, smaller, smaller pieces. Eventually that stuff can be absorbed, just like other food products or other, other things that we ingest. So that's a worry. Um, here is, uh, so Vanessa and Dorothy are working on some of this stuff. And this is an image from Dorothy last week or a week or so ago. So here's one of our sand crabs. A lot of you guys have helped us out with our sand crab stuff, either during the oil spill or, 
or other times. And this this is actually not natural. This is this is a, an experiment. But she took some plastic pieces and put them in the container and put a, a living crab in there with them, and then uh, let it let it sort of do its business for a little bit, and then killed it because we're scientists, so we have to kill things, and slice it open. And sure enough, I mean this is not in the bloodstream, but sure enough, we see you know ingested all of these the, the purple things here are, are her marked pieces of you know tracer plastic 96 so there you go so there are 96 uh pieces in here right and uh and so we see this kind of stuff but it's not just this here's a piece from earlier this summer this is a piece and these this is a millimeter for scale so this little shard is a uh, you know who knows what that came from don't know plastic bottle uh, uh, whatever, but that was inside the gut of a, of a, you know, different sand crab. So this stuff is getting into um, these critters, and this is not a far away problem. This is right here in Ventura County, um, as well as is all around. Did you want to say anything else about? So this, you said 96 uh, pellets in this one. Vanessa, anything else you want to say about that guy? Um, well, not specifically that guy, but I mean, um, Mark Buckley Foster. Right, so so our controls from the field, to be clear, are, are just randomly grabbed guys outside of any kind of experimental manipulation have plastics in all of them, right? So that's awesome. Uh, this is a paper that came out a couple weeks ago and uh, was looking at fish, at, at the guts of fish. And um, what they, so they, they grabbed some fish from Indonesia they grab some fish from California, and they uh, looked at the gut, at the um, intestinal tracts of these these fish, and just pulled them apart and saw what they looked, saw what they found. Now, some cases you can ident you can actually identify under the microscope what the thing is. In this case, this is monofilament. This was coming most likely from a fishing uh, fishing activity, so a fishing net probably. Um, you could, in some cases, tell something is styrofoam. So that's coming from oftentimes floats. And then just other indescribable, but a plastic chunk. But clearly it, this was a piece of something larger that was plastic. You can also identify fibers. So again, this would be like our polyesters. This would be our, our, our and, and our interpretation of this usually so far is that this, was, this is coming from most likely clothing or, or, or spun, spun products. So what we see is um, in both these, in Indonesia and in the U.S., we see, and this is, this is of all the samples they've, they found from looking at all these, all the seafood, um, you know, relative proportions. And what we see is um, uh, in the United States, what's dominating? Microfibers or, or, or uh, yeah, let's call it microfibers, plastic fibrous stuff. Um, uh, up here in Indonesia, it's more of the actual broken pieces of larger plastic, right? So in the U.S., where presumably we don't have, we have a, we do a presumably better job about just throwing crap out into the ocean. Not so much crap just floating in the ocean, but we're seeing a lot of. The, and so, so where is this coming from? You guys think where, where's all this microfiber coming from? Urban cities. Who's generating it? We are. Yeah, all of, all of you guys, I am generating this. So every time we do, we do a, laundry, a wash of laundry, um, I think it, fleece is I think the worst. Fleece sheds the most. But that stuff's synthetic. So presumably with cotton too. Presumably we put a cotton shirt in your washing machine, you wash, 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 and the wash water comes out. And there's probably a little snapped off twig of cotton fiber right but that's that's a plant material that's relatively rapidly degraded this plastic stuff is not so every single one of our washing machines is putting this stuff out and this is these things are smaller than we can typically deal or that we typically deal with in uh, anything that we would have in our house certainly but also our treatment plants our treatment plants they didn't know about this when we were designing our treatment plants right we didn't we didn't figure this out until recently and so our, our our, our tools to filter and clean the water, apparently, as, as this shows, because we're getting this stuff in fish and th stuff, right? It doesn't, it doesn't work. We, we don't do a good job at containing our part particulate plastic uh, waste. 
And again, this is what we see. So this is that same study in, in, the, in California and Indonesia. And here is, this is just other identified trash that came from people. This is a discrete plastic pieces and this is fibers. And again, not really any fibers to speak of in Indonesia, but fibers are a pretty common uh, chunk in our California uh, samples and fibers are greater than the plastic, discrete plastic pieces here in California. And we're seeing that as well in our, in our data that we collect. So uh, Aspen said that, right, you know, big urban areas, and that's true. Uh, industrial activities, urban areas are the greatest sources of those things, of that, that pollution. And that's actually a, a positive thing, right? In the sense that if everybody's concentrated in one spot, that means it's, it's, it should be, at least to some extent, relatively easy to deal with it, right? This is, this is more akin to a point source, even though it's not maybe necessarily technically all point source. It's all from a similar area or people behaving with similar technology, right? As opposed to say something like um, carbon emissions, which are, which are you know, all distributed. It's happening in the forest, it's happening in the cities, it's happening everywhere. So this suggests that the options to deal with plastic, um, we, we can, we get, we can, with a little bit of effort, we can have potentially a huge impact on the amount of plastics going into the ocean. So this is, this is from not every country in the world, but this is from most countries that they could get data from. And this is in the year 2010. So, so something like a quarter of a billion tons of plastic coming out each year from, say, just cities. Does that seem like a lot? Or does that seem like a little? You guys, you guys are mystified. You can't make, can't make heads or tails. These numbers are too big. Can't, can't figure it out. Too hard to get your mind around it. OK, well, it makes sense of Aspen. So there we go. We're going to go on. OK, excellent. Um, this is this this is from that same paper I just mentioned. Um, so this is uh, what they identified as the essentially current situation. This is five years old, but still this is this is our most recent data. And so what they did was they went in and they looked. Uh, that data I just showed you is from uh, folks in the coastal zone. Again, as we've talked about, everybody has a different definition of what the coastal zone is. Right? Sometimes it's a mile in, mile out. Sometimes it's five miles, 10 miles, 50. These guys used um, a 50 kilometer uh, creek, a 50 kilometer uh, buffer. And so what do you see? Right, so the more people, more plastics, sure. But it's also, there seems to be particular problems from a couple places. So. Indonesia, this area, Southeast Asia, China, right? The the Viet, the the Korean Peninsula, and all these guys. So this is, this appears to be the the epicenter, the hotbed of of plastic entering the ocean. That's not to say it's not, it's, but again, it, right? It is going on everywhere. Everybody's pumping out plastic, but in these areas in particular, it appears to be distinct. Um, I mean that makes sense. Because, yeah. I mean, Right, right. The, the, the greatest amount of plastic synthesis and, and uh, forming into whatever is going on in these areas. So totally. Um, uh, maybe not the strongest laws to deal with pollution. Or uh, that, that, that might be an unfair characterization. Um, not the strongest enforcement of existing laws. And countries that are either a high level of poverty or or have economic growth as the, as, a, as the priority. And other things, not that they don't care about other things, but maybe not as much of a priority in terms of dealing with the waste and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, so there we go. This, the, so these guys then took, out, took, took what they worked on, right? So this was, this was basically a metadata analysis, looking at all these sources of plastic from 192 countries, and this is what it was in 2010. And they, they try to do some extrapolation with some assumptions of relatively high uh, or, 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 or not well managed waste streams down to uh, and then sort of an intermediary level and then a relatively high level of management or mitigation in, in terms of those waste streams and trying to entrain or, or capture or remove those uh, sources of plastic. I don't think it's exactly that. And so um, 
in any event, we're, we're talking about, regardless of what the level is here, we're talking about, right, one, at least, at least one, two, three, at least about tripling, probably our, our output of plastic, if not, you know, orders of magnitude increases in plastic stuff. So this is basically a call to action saying we need to, we need to get serious about this stuff. Understandable, these things are small, underst oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes. And, and maybe we haven't been paying attention because we haven't been looking in the ocean too closely, but oh my gosh, now that we know about this, let's see if we can do something uh, about this. So why, why is this? Obviously, we've talked about this already and, and there's different ideas we can talk about, but, but in general, low cost manufacturing, that, it, that plastic is cheap. Right. We can I mean, you can't have these high end, crazy, sophisticated plastics, but most are cheap. Right. We've built our whole economy for the last hundred years on providing cheap oil for cheap energy and cheap oil for cheap product um, uh, creation, uh, that kind of stuff. And uh, to be very clear, that was deemed a net public good. Right. So, so we created policies and gave incentives to the greater extraction of petroleum, incentives to people doing all kinds of crazy cool chemistry with, um, you know, the, the oil is just a fantastic, awesome, awesome product to do chemistry on, right? It's, it's this, this big, you know, polymers and you can make, you know, six unit things or a hundred unit things. So it's, it's a really, really cool um, playground in which to play and make different types of compounds. So it sort of is a natural fit but in addition, we also really encourage that. We encourage the production of, of uh, plastics for a whole variety of reasons. In addition, in recent decades, I just I, we started off show, looking at that cartoon, but entities like the American uh, Plastics Council and, and uh, related uh, entities have uh, also pushed pretty hard to talk about that we should be careful about this because plastics are so great and, and, and are sort of constantly in there uh, giving the message that, you know, hey, plastics aren't all bad. There's there's positive sides of this and, and life would be really different if we didn't have plastics. So let's look at a couple of these. So that's, that's one common argument. Here's another one. Today, we're recycling more plastics than ever before. Recycling can turn these valuable resources into new products, such as car bumpers, fleece jackets, plastic lumber for your backyard deck, and protective packaging. But some plastics cannot be recycled economically today. Is there a better option than burying these resources in landfills? One promising alternative is converting plastics to fuels. Just like it sounds, these technologies convert used, non-recycled plastics into oil, fuels, and other petroleum-based products. Which came from oil. The process is fairly simple. Plastics that are not currently being recycled are heated without oxygen, using a process called pyrolysis to convert plastics into a gas state. These gases are then cooled and can be condensed into different products. Crude oil that can be refined into fuels and the feedstocks for other products, including plastics. Transportation fuels to power cars, buses, ships and planes. Petroleum products such as petrochemicals and lubricants that can be used in manufacturing and other industries. And fuel oils to produce electricity. Because plastics to fuels technologies could provide us with the ability to divert valuable materials from landfills and create an abundant source of alternative energy, the economic and environmental benefits of this technology are striking. If current capacity were to be expanded so that the U.S. could convert all its non-recycled plastics into oil each year, we could produce 5.7 billion gallons of transportation fuel annually, enough to power nearly 9 million cars per year. Additionally, the U.S. could support up to 600 plastics to fuels facilities, which could generate nearly 39,000 jobs and up to $9 billion in economic output. Plus, these technologies could reduce greenhouse gas emissions by up to 70% when compared to traditional forms of crude oil extraction. 
But the companies that process plastics into oils and fuels are encountering a stumbling block to achieving these benefits. Unfortunately, the existing legal frameworks in some states do not account for these technologies and incorrectly treat these technologies like regular waste disposal. The result? Communities continue to bury valuable resources in landfills. Policymakers can remove this stumbling block by updating regulations and permitting processes to reflect 21st century technologies by treating plastics to fuels equally with renewable energy technologies and by recognizing plastics to fuels technologies for what they are. A complement to community recycling programs, a domestic source of alternative energy and a boost for American jobs, and a manufacturing process that uses resources that would otherwise go to landfill to create valuable products in communities all across the country. It's time to stop burying valuable resources and embrace technologies that are good for the environment and good for America. Uh, so, so uh, yeah, I don't know why a sheep was baying in, in the offshore North Carolina oil drilling uh, thing. Sorry. But uh, let's look at this. This is his last one, which is um, there's a documentary called Bag It. I don't know if any of you guys have seen that, but about plastic bags and, and efforts to, to ban single-use plastic bags. And um, I just wanted to play the response. I want to play a the response to that film looks at the issue of litter in our environment and asks what we can all do to reduce our footprint. Although there are some omissions and errors and issues that we frankly think would have benefited from a more balanced presentation, the film is a welcome addition to the public discussion on how we can more responsibly use the materials that we rely on every day. Here's where we all agree. Plastics don't belong in the ocean. All of us have a role to play in reducing reusing, recycling, and recovering the plastics that we rely on every day. Hopefully this film will remind everyone the importance of litter prevention. But we can't lose sight of why we use plastics in the first place. Plastics make modern life possible. Every day, innovations in plastics help provide products like car safety seats, bicycle helmets. They make our cars lighter and more energy efficient. And innovations in plastic packaging help extend food shelf life allowing us to enjoy our favorite foods and drinks for even longer. Take the milk carton, for example. In the past, when you opened a half-gallon cardboard carton of milk, you broke the airtight seal. But now, thanks to an innovation in plastic packaging, you can reseal that milk carton, keeping the contents fresh longer for your family to enjoy. And that's just part of the story. Every day, plastics help us do more with less. For example, in order to deliver 10 gallons of a beverage, you'd need only two pounds of plastic, but you'd need three pounds of aluminum, eight pounds of steel, or almost 40 pounds of glass to deliver that same beverage. And because plastic is so much lighter than other materials, making packaging from plastics allows us to reduce our use of energy, reduce waste, and have fewer greenhouse gas emissions than we would with other materials. For example, Plastic water bottles today use 20% less material than they used just a few years ago. But no matter how useful or efficient, littered and discarded material of any kind, whether plastic, paper, steel, or aluminum, they don't belong on our beaches or in our oceans. Through the American Chemistry Council, plastic makers are working to increase opportunities to recycle plastics, to educate consumers about opportunities to recycle, and to remind folks about the importance of thoughtful consumption. And one of our programs has placed over 700 recycling bins along California state park beaches and heavily trafficked rest areas along the coast. Innovations in chemistry provide many benefits to modern life, and it's important for consumers to know that chemicals and products that they use are thoroughly evaluated through a comprehensive set of federal rules and more than a dozen laws and regulations. For example, Consumers can feel confident that all food contact packaging is subject to strict FDA review and approval before it's placed on the market. And our member companies fully support efforts to modernize our U.S. chemical management system. We all deserve to have confidence that our government has the highest quality information available to make important decisions about chemical safety. And finally, here's some simple tips to help us all reduce what we use and to recycle and recover what we can't. First, if you don't need a plastic bag, don't take it. And if you have a reusable bag, be sure to bring it along with you. 
At lunchtime, we can reduce by using reusable plastic containers or by drinking from reusable plastic bottles. Recycling varies by community, but these days, most curbside programs accept all plastic bottles for recycling, and major grocery and retail chains accept plastic bags and film. And remember, keep the caps on the bottles. Recyclers want those too. We've got just this one planet. We're all in this together to keep it clean. So, um, so I think what, what those videos show is that uh, there's, there's a clear interest in, um, and people recognize that uh, it's important to reach out to you guys and, and make sure that uh, different opinions are being heard. And, you know, you guys always make up your own mind in, in the, the, our class as to what's going on and, and this and that. Um, but I would, I would, at a minimum, I would encourage you guys to always listen to other folks, even if you think that, oh my gosh, this person's going to say something stupid or this person's from this. Um, uh, I always want you guys to be heard. You should always want to be heard. We should always, always have an open view and we should always hear what um, all sides of the argument are articulating, what they're saying. And clearly, I think it's great that we have, um, for example, uh, plastic bottles uh, so that when we have, you know, IV fluids or something in the back of an ambulance bouncing down a, a city street, that, that medicine isn't breaking open and in an old glass thing. Um, I think, you know, we could, there's something like that. I think the vast majority of us can agree on that. Whether that translates into having everybody needing to have a plastic bottle every single time they want to have a drink of water, I, I, don't, I don't see how that argument relates there. But, but clearly there are some things we can agree upon um, uh, uh, our generation of waste and how we how we how we deal with it. So, um, obviously, there's all we could sit here for hours and go through all these different um, examples and arguments back and forth. Um, I would say, in generally, in generally, there's a lot of heat around plastic bags, single-use plastic bags. There's a lot of heat around plastic water bottles, and you know, good. Let's let's deal with that. Let's let's tackle that one. That is incredibly low-hanging fruit. That is not the majority of the problem that we're, we're seeing out here. Um, uh, but it is, um, it is something we can latch on. Another example is uh, cigarette butts on our beaches. Everybody always finds cigarette butts whenever we do a beach cleanup. And it's obvious because one, it's super easy to identify, right? You can tell that a cigarette butt is a cigarette butt. Secondly, they have these, these cotton, um, you know, the, the, they're, they're filters, right? So if they're in a watershed, they're going to float. So they tend, to, so, so they're, they're biased to be, to make it to the beach more so than other pieces of trash. So kind of the physics means they're more likely to get down there. They're a thing that you and I can understand. They're, they're a, a shape and a size we can understand. And um, while we still have a lot of smokers in our, um, in our country, uh, there are fewer and fewer smokers every year. And so it's kind of just like with the plastics and this other stuff, it's kind of easier to say, you bastard, you smoker people, you're such messed up people, you smoked, right? And it's a, it's a, it's, it's a very sort of um, automatic way to sort of look at something and say, oh, that, you're the problem, right? You, dude, pfft, yeah, you know. And so, um, so there are some things like the cigarette butts, like plastic bottles, like plastic bags that are that are the low-hanging fruit and the obvious targets to start with right but the vast majority of stuff the vast majority of say all these microfibers that we're finding in our beaches in our sand crabs those aren't coming from cigarettes those aren't coming from plastic bottles probably there's not they're not coming from plastic bags probably they're coming from more of the stuff that you and I engage with and wear in our bodies every single day so um, so that's not to say we shouldn't do that, deal with that, but just let, let's be careful about um, going too far down of, uh, the, the blame game thing. Um, okay, so obviously, as we talked about before, just to wrap, just to wrap this up and bring it, tie it into some of the things we've been talking about before, uh, this is, these little pieces of plastic are responding to the physics of the ocean, right? So those circulation patterns we talked about before, they're still at play. Right? They're, they're why we have these concentrations of plastics where we do. Uh, again, these are dynamic systems. I, I, I 
would reiterate to you guys these are three-dimensional we, we typically simplify them in our diagrams but but this is really a three-dimensional thing and it's cre it creates much more of this conveyor belt up down loopy loop 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 that kind of stuff um, the thing that you guys uh, what, what, what have you guys heard, what do you guys know about we've had some readings on them we've had a we have a polling question on this what do you guys know about the Great Pacific garbage patch or patches Okay. Okay, good. Right. So, the, so there's, so it's not just uh, a skin. It's sort of, it's sort of near the surface. A lot of it's near the surface, but it's not, it's not all at the exact surface. Air, air, water interface. What else? So we really have these two different, two distinct areas. Even though sometimes we talk about it as being one. We have these two uh, large gyres, right, or, or, or large scale spinning of currents such that they create a distinct water mass. So we have one closer to basically just north of the Hawaiian Islands uh, and, 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 and or between the Hawaii and us. And then we have one that's farther out in the Eastern Pacific. Uh, so the gyres, uh, each one of these is, is on the vague order of the state of Texas. So they're pretty big. They're, they're pretty uh, large areas. And, you know, every, every study that comes back has a different number. And, and, and so it, it, it gets a little bit problematic to compare things from, some people are looking at microplastics, some people are looking at large plastics. But, you know, we're talking something like on the surface or near to the surface, something like a million pieces per square mile. And I think that's a, that's a relatively easy number to keep in your head when you're having conversations with the public if they're asking you about um, like your surveys and things you're doing. But this is a cool story. This was a freighter. And, this, and since then, there's a whole website. Some guys have sort of dedicated themselves to doing this. So what we used to do, we used to use drogues. We used, and we still do. But we used to use... Uh, especially back in the days before satellites, where does the current go? Uh, way back when we actually used um, messages in a bottle, right? Yeah, there was a great story uh, about three weeks, two, three weeks ago about um, this one marine lab in the UK uh, had released a bunch, of, a bunch of bottles with notes saying, if you find this, you'll get one shilling. If you, if you mail this postcard back to us, we'll mail you one shilling. I want to say it was like 1940 or 1930, something like that. And they released all these bottles. And over the course of the next two, three, four years, they got a lot of them back. Over the course of the next decade or two, they got a few back. And then they haven't had anything since the early 70s. And this lady actually found one of these bottles and sent it in. And the point was those, um, I'll put a link to that if you guys haven't seen that story. Uh, the point was we used these neutrally buoyant things to measure where the water mass was going. Right? And so by dropping a bunch of these things off, and then when people pick them up, they, wrote, they would record their location, we could tell, ah, this water is mostly going east, this water is mostly going north, what have you. In this case, this one was a, a freighter that got caught in a storm and basically broke up and dumped a bunch of the conics boxes. And it just so happened these, these guys had a bunch of toys. These are bathroom toys, and these are specifically rubber duckies. So Ernie would be sto Ernie was stoked. And the cool thing is, these are just about the perfect thing. These are about the perfect thing because you put them in the water, and they don't float totally on top of the water, right? They're a little bit under, but yet they're 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 a little, like the head of the duck is kind of pointing above the water, right? <laughs> so they're staying right on the surface. They're not sinking. They're not some big sail that's mostly being affected by the wind. They really are pretty much perfect trackers of what that surface water is, how that, where that surface water is moving to. And so uh, over the course of the past, it's more than 20 years now. Um, it, okay, so, so it, it happened. And then, uh, so this is where, so the ship left uh, Hong Kong. It was coming to the, the States and it cracked open. And people first started noticing these things in the Pacific Northwest and up in Alaska. And so... Uh, basically by going back and tracking this and now there's actually a website where if, when you find stuff you guys can go report stuff but basically by finding these different rubber duckies washing up in different areas but able to track through the lot number and stuff track where these currents go right and that's pretty cool 
So this was a, in a sense, a natural. It was a, it was a pollution experiment, but but it, it was an unintended experiment that actually has helped uh, helped us uh, confirm some issues, some some thoughts about uh, surface circulation patterns and stuff. So pollu so throwing plastic in the ocean isn't necessarily all bad. That's what I was I was trying to say with that. Um, and so yeah, right. So that it happened ninety two, and they're still they're still going they're still going strong. So to wrap up, I'll just say, how might we, so let's say we do all this great stuff. Uh, Vanessa's got all this data about these sand crabs and the amount of plastic in sand. And, and we got this data about the stuff in fish and deep sea corals. Okay, cool. Um, how might we integrate that into a model wherein we compare the effect of over harvesting or fragmentation in that same context? The plastics 